I've been in politics for more than 20 years now. Um, I've been to a lot of hearings. This was uh, maybe the most impressive panel uh, that I've ever heard. So I want to thank each of the individual testifiers for their clarity, for their advocacy, uh, and, and for helping us to build the legislative record. Uh, Mr. Garriott, um, can you talk about cross deputization? I want, I, and by the way, I'm going to ask a lot of questions, so I'd like everybody to be as brief as possible. Talk about cross deputization, how it works, and why it seems to be increasing uh, as a practice. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, cross deputization, as, as, as many know, uh, there is a maze that is incredibly difficult to understand and even more incredibly difficult to implement for law enforcement around jurisdiction. On one side of a line, depending on the victim, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the perpetrator, uh, it might be tribal jurisdiction. On another side of the line, it might be state jurisdiction. Cross deputization allows tribes and state law enforcement to be deputized in another jurisdiction so that they can eliminate those jurisdictional gaps. It is a uh, practice that is uh, gaining more and more increased use by tribes. And, and I think that that is a, an incredible uh, testament to the effectiveness and the solutions that it can offer. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Randall, uh, we know there have been zero valid habeas corpus petitions filed and zero due process claims. Uh, since 2013. Um, just tell me, has special jurisdiction been a success? Absolutely, Senator. It's been a success for those individuals who have finally gotten the, the justice that they need, as well as for the communities that can, uh, you know, interrupt perpetrators who may have been acting with impunity. And significantly, it's been a success in protecting defendants' rights as well, as you noted, um, you know, with, with no valid habeas cases, as well as, you know, the rates of acquittals and dismissals show how careful tribes have been with implementation. And we, that's why this committee, you know, must expand recognition uh, to other crimes. Thank you. And uh, a follow-up on this issue, Professor Reese, uh, just for the record, is special criminal jurisdiction constitutional? Uh, thank you. Uh, so absolutely. Um, so I think that when I'm asked that question, I think about it on two levels. Uh, first, that whether or not Congress sort of has the power to do this. Um, and the answer to that question is absolutely. Congress has the power to do that especially since the Supreme Court decision in United States versus Laura um, affirmed that uh, tribal sovereignty is inherent and that Congress has the ability to reaffirm the existence of inherent sovereignty uh, by passing legislation which reauthorizes tribes to exercise a power uh, even that they previously were um, not authorizing based on a Supreme Court decision in this case, and also um, in in Lara uh, Oliphant. So absolutely, you have the power to do this. Um, and as similarly discussed in Lara, um, the only other questions would be if it implicates any other uh, constitutional rights concerns. Um, but we've known for several hundred <laughs> years now uh, that the Constitution does not apply to uh, tribal governments in the same way. So uh, that is also not an issue. Um, but going above and beyond that, con uh, Congress has also created equivalent constitutional rights protections through this statute. So those sort of underlying concerns um, are also protected um, and incorporated into this law, uh, even though that constitutional um, question itself isn't, isn't really implicated. At the risk of being redundant, um, I, I want to ask you to, you know, really make this point as clear as possible to, to anybody who's watching this hearing, uh, what the Indian Civil Rights Act does uh, for defendants and for the justice system uh, in Indian country, because you, you mentioned in your testimony, you're, you're referring to it now, but I think it's a really key point as it relates to due process as a matter of principle and as a, as a matter of law. And I'd like you to just flesh it out just a little bit. No, absolutely. So um, it guarantees, uh, long list of uh, equivalent protections that are guaranteed to the rest of the citizens of the United States um, in 
courts of law. So the I'll go ahead and just list out these protections that the Indian Civil Rights Act, the Tribal Law and Order Act, and VAWA 2013 sort of when combined um, guarantee to non-Indian defendants. So that includes the protection to the basic right to due process of law, the freedom from an illegal or warrantless search or seizure, the prohibition against double jeopardy, the right against self-incrimination, the right to a speedy trial and confront witnesses, the right to a jury trial, the right to indigent defense, the right to effective assistance of counsel, the prohibition on bills of attainder, the right to not be subjected to cruel or unusual punishment, excessive fines or fees. Like this is the entire gamut of the things that the constitution does to protect the rights of defendants when they're being prosecuted for a crime. Like that is the full list of things that was written up into this statute to protect non-Indian defendants in this court system. And any time that one of those things, you know, if it were to happen, results in an unlawful detention or incarceration of someone, they are protected by the writ of habeas corpus. Thank you very much. Uh, my final question before an additional uh, round, uh, Mr. Gary, we've, we've heard about the high cost of implementation. Um, I'm just, wondering what the department is doing to assist tribes in implementation. All of this is great as authorizing language, but you know, it does seem to me, doesn't seem to me, it's obvious to me that it's a resource question too. It's a, it's a, how, how do you cover the jurisdictions that are so vast? I'm thinking about Alaska in particular, but really uh, Indian country everywhere. You have this problem of staffing, of having a person on the ground how do you help? How can you help? Mr. Chairman, th thank you for the question. Uh, and, and as you've touched on, the resources is an, is an issue and a challenge that we hear all the time from uh, our tribal partners and those that we work with on the ground. Um, thus far, since 2019, uh, we have funded 115 tribal court positions, uh, which includes tribal judges, uh, prosecutors, and other court personnel uh, across the country to help tribes uh, have some of the resources they need to on the implementation side. Uh, I would also point to our FY22 uh, uh, budget request, uh, which is a total of 507 million, uh, which it represents an increase of 58 million over uh, the FY22. Uh, uh, 21. Um, a big part of this, this budget request uh, puts boots on the ground uh, and it will begin assisting tribes uh, to better uh, provide law enforcement for their communities and better protect their, their citizens. Thank you very much. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member. I cannot thank you enough for having this conversation today on such an important issue. Uh, it, it is so clear uh, that the Violence Against Women's uh, Act um, needs to be passed, and the special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction is essential to protecting our, our Native communities. I strongly believe uh, that Congress must not only reauthorize VAWA, but strengthen it to ensure that tribes can effectively prosecute crimes against uh, women, children, and law enforcement in Indian country. So I'm going to focus my areas, uh, com questions around that. But I want to follow up on what Chairman Schatz started with. Um, uh, and uh, let, me, let me ask this question. President Sharp, uh, how many more tribes do you think would be interested in implementing special criminal jurisdiction if they had the resources and support that they needed to do so? I'm curious if you have an answer for that. Yes, I would say out of the 574 tribal nations, uh, the remaining, which is hundreds of tribal nations would be interested if we had the resources. Right, and, and my understanding is there's only, is it 28 now that have the ability? Yes. Okay, so we yes. need more, we need to do more. So let me ask you this, you, you heard um, uh, what um, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary said, Garriott, um, do you think based on the resources that he says are available, that that's enough and, and what more should we be considering in Congress to provide the resources that are necessary to give more of our tribal nations across the country the opportunity to protect their own? 
Yes, uh, in just listening to his his response, I mean, clearly we don't have even close uh, to the scale of resources necessary to implement uh, the spirit and intent of what Congress is trying to accomplish here. And one can only look to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights uh, report called the Broken Promises that was delivered to Congress almost three years now. Uh, and, and they detail not uh, when federal agency is living up to its trust responsibility. We are woefully and chronically underfunded across every sector, including our criminal justice system. So we definitely have a, a large scale need in Indian country to implement VAWA. Thank you. And Ms. Demmer, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that children have been involved as victims or witnesses in special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction cases nearly 60 percent of the time. Uh, to me, that is just unacceptable that children are falling through the cracks of, of laws meant to combat violence in Indian country. So when it comes to the safety and the health of our Native children, how important is it uh, for Congress to expand the current special tribal jurisdiction to cover more crimes? Can you talk a little bit about what crimes that are not covered, that in essence are, are, are where our children are victims that we should be looking to protect their interests? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Cortez Masso. And um, I, um, I don't believe I said that about children. I said children are our first responders, but fortunately, I did work for a tribe that uh, implemented domestic violence jurisdiction back in 2013 as one of the first three tribes. And in that, um, our children were um, in our first year. I think we had 11 cases. And nine of those cases, children were victims of violence. And in one case, we had a child who um, was trying to get, you know, as a first responder, trying to get the father off of his her mother, and um, and the child was tossed aside, um, and um, and had to, um, you know, I, I believe, you know, probably called for the police. But um, you know, these are just that's just an example. Um, all all of these cases. Um, frequently involve um, children being present and being uh, participants of um, the violence that's committed against the mother. Um, in another case, we had a, um, a case where a, um, the mother was held hostage for a few days and um, a knife was being thrown at her um, and he um, made her um, the mother hold the victim or hold a child in her arms uh, while he threw knives at her. And um, fortunately, that case was ended up being picked up by um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and so the child did see justice. But in so many other cases, there is not justice. And in Alaska, in particular, um, you know, I just want to bring it back to that: um, our children are the first responders have to call for help, um, and we don't have law enforcement. Often, we have uh, volunteer medics, and so it, the the her, the parade of horribles are horrible, but we have beautiful communities that we want to protect and safeguard. So goodness sheesh for the question. I hope I answered it. You did, thank you. Let, let me talk a little bit, and you touched on this as well. I know from my time as Attorney General that domestic violence calls are some of the most dangerous calls uh, that police officers can respond to as well. And um, uh, Director Randall, your testimony discusses the very real safety concerns that tribal law enforcement officers have when they're responding to these kinds of calls. So right now, what happens if a tribal officer is responding to a domestic violence call and the non-Indian suspect attacks the officer? Well, without jurisdiction, the federal government must respond. And this can really empower perpetrators to commit acts of violence, knowing that, you know, a, a federal response could be hours away. You know, in the case of Alaska, responses could be days away. And as you note, these are dangerous calls for law enforcement officers. And this is a crucial part of VAWA to, uh, to include. To include coverage or protection. To include Wrong. coverage of protection. Responding, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And then, uh, um, Secretary Garriott, um, your testimony mentions that expanding tribal criminal jurisdiction beyond domestic violence crimes would be a significant step toward ending the crisis of uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and children. Uh, can you 
talk a little bit about this. How reauthorizing and strengthening VAW will help ensure we are using all of the available tools that we need to keep Native women and children safe? Thank you for the question. Uh, this is an issue that is uh, of particularly uh, concern and, and is very important to the Secretary and to the Department. Uh, expanding criminal jurisdiction to cover a wide variety of crimes, as we've heard, is, is incredibly important, uh, not only for children and for law enforcement, but also expanding the crimes to include not just uh, coverage of protection orders and uh, domestic violence, but sex trafficking uh, and other uh, dating violence and other crimes as well. Uh, as we know, there is no one simple kind of crime uh, and that we need to have full coverage uh, to ensure that, that our, our tribes, our law enforcement officers, children have uh, full protection. Thank you. And thank you again. This is an incredible panel. I so appreciate your advocacy on such an important issue that needs to pass Congress. Standing in for the chair, I am going to call in, I understand Senator Smith is next and she is joining us virtually. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Chair Cortez Masto. And um, uh, thanks to all of you. I am um, just so grateful for this important panel. I wanna start by thanking Chair Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski for your work on this bipartisan agreement to reauthorize the tribal provisions of the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and I also wanna thank you, them, for including my Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Violence Act, um, which would expand tribal criminal jurisdiction to include crimes of dating and sexual violence, sex trafficking, stalking, and obstruction of justice by non-Native offenders on tribal lands. Um, the many conversations I've had with um, folks in Minnesota um, have convinced me that this measure is really essential to addressing the crisis, really the epidemic of violence against Native women. So I'd like to focus my questions on, on that, and um, I'll start with you, President Sharp. It's so good to see you again, um, even virtually. Um, we, of course, both know that more in more than four and five Native women experience violence in their lifetimes, and many of them are victimized by non-Native um, offenders. Uh, and this ongoing crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women um, and people across the country is, is so, so severe. Um, I believe that this My Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Violence Act, um, which is included in this bipartisan agreement, would help to address this. So could I ask you to speak to that? Could you talk to how um, that expanded tribal jurisdiction would help tribes to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women? And I wanna just say, I, since I have been running around today, I forgive, forgive me if I'm asking a question that is repetitive of others' questions, but I really wanna have a chance to visit with you about this. Yes, absolutely. And, and first of all, I wanna thank you for your leadership and your ability to see from our perspective, the real threat that all of these issues that, that you are seeking to address mean to us. It, 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 it's quite remarkable uh, to have someone with your level of advocacy around such critical issues. So yes, uh, this would definitely go a long way to help. And, and the way in which it would help the missing and murdered indigenous women's crises, I think it's important for everyone to understand our women and our girls are being targeted by perpetrators. They know there's a weakness. They know there's a void, a jurisdictional void. And so those girls who are targeted for trafficking, those uh, women who uh, not only have uh, dating relationships, but absolute strangers that uh, come onto tribal lands, as well as law enforcement who seek to protect them, these provisions would ensure that those gaps in our missing and murdered indigenous women's crisis would be met, that we would be able to fill those gaps and, and ensure that we have justice in these critical areas because we are being targeted. So thank you for your leadership and recognizing that and trying to help solve that with us. See you well. Thank you. I think um, people don't uh, realize the extent to which Native women live in a justice-free zone where they are targeted. It is no accident. Um, it is a feature of our system that Native women are targeted in this way. And it is our our obligation, our moral obligation to address that. And so, so I appreciate your comments. Um, Governor Shavaria, it is good to see you. As a New Mexico born senator, um, I am so happy to see your the visual behind you as well. So um, greetings to you and everybody at Santa Clara. 
I was wondering if you could talk about how the expanded jurisdiction your tribe implemented um, has helped you to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous um, people. And could you comment on how the expanded jurisdiction in, in, in this bipartisan agreement would help to further address uh, this challenge? Well, thank you, uh, Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you, uh, Senator, I appreciate that question. I think what's very important is that we have to recognize that uh, the Maori authorization, when it expired, you know, we need a permanent authorization, as was mentioned by, by the witnesses here, to expand that tribal jurisdiction over the crimes against our children. You know, here in Santa Clara, we have multi-generations living under one household, that includes grandpa and grandma, and also law enforcement. Personnel, sexual assault crimes committed by strangers to provide increased safety and access to that justice services for victims of crime is very essential. So it is important that all the discussions happening today will, will help fulfill the life, safety, and welfare of our entire community within our public communities. Without that, it makes it challenging. And so you have that opportunity right now to help us uh, within our judicial system, our law enforcement, but also as a tribal government to so implement this for the life, safety, and welfare of our entire community. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and I am, I want to just say how grateful I am to Senator Ben Ray Lujan's leadership on this issue as well. I don't know if Senator Lujan has had an opportunity to ask his questions yet, but I want to um, uh, nod to his um, leadership. We're so grateful for him. Madam Chair, I will uh, yield back if you have others in line. I have one other question if you don't. I think I think we have a full slate, Senator Smith. We've got oh, a lot of interest in this, so thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump in here, um, if I may, as I am next in line. And uh, uh, this is directed to you, Michelle. Um, thank you for, again, your, your ongoing leadership, and not only over the years, but over the decades as you are working to protect um, vulnerable Native women throughout out the state of Alaska. Um, we talked, we've heard continuously here about the gaps um, that need to be addressed, and I think there is no no better area to look at the the, the chasm that uh, uh, that exists when it comes to um, the inability to to protect currently protect um, people in in so many of our native villages. But you have you have some unique experience within the uh, DOJ Intertribal Working Group for the Lower 40 tri 48 Tribes. So you've had an opportunity to observe down in, in the lower 48 and, and then um, extrapolate how we can make things better in Alaska. Resources obviously are important. Funding is important for training. Uh, funding is important on so many levels. But is it, what more can we be doing specifically in, in enhancing uh, our efforts? Is it supporting the intertribal participation in the pilots uh, to accommodate economies of scale? Is it building the cross-jurisdictional uh, collaboration? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of second guessing that it might be all of the above, but if you can speak to what more we can be doing specifically to address these gaps here in Alaska, there in Alaska. Uh, Vice Chairman. Murkowski, we so appreciate your leadership in this bill, as well as other important bills, such as the boarding school bill. Um, as to your question, thank you so much for it. It is all of the above. Think about it. Since statehood over 60 years ago, Public Law 280 has been in effect, meaning the state has had jurisdiction in what has happened. We, as Indigenous women, have been horrifically unsafe. We have some of the worst DV rates, the worst murder rates, the highest missing native rates, and our victims are too often left without any justice or it is delayed in that it re-victimizes us. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual assault from someone that was abused in boarding schools. The state has had 63 years to show their competencies, give us time and similar resources. Don't tie our hands. We have beautiful communities, beautiful traditions, and deserve better. We are state and federal citizens in addition to our tribal citizenship. 
Principal Deputy Director Randall explained in her testimony how successful the ITWIG is. The tribes can exchange views, information, and advice about how they can best exercise special domestic violence court jurisdiction, combat domestic violence, attend meetings, webinars, share ideas, material challenges, and best practices. The ITWIG I participated in as a point of contact for one of the first three tribes was a wealth of information, and Virginia Davis at NCAI and others like her were amazing. The support they provided and we the dialogue that we exchanged was simply um, one of a kind and should be replicated whenever possible. Goodness Chish Hawa, Senator Murkowski, you are just so appreciated. As you are, Gunish Jish. Let me direct uh, my next question here to uh, our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Garriott. Um, it, was, it was good to see the BIA dispersing about $30 million um, uh, to tribes in PLA 280 states, even though BIA doesn't uh, execute the 638 contracts and the compacts for public safety and justice. So um, what, what I am what I'm hoping to learn is, is how, uh, how we can navigate some of these roadblocks to public safety and access that we have in Alaska. Um, recognizing that we are a PL280 state, is there some kind of an internal policy out there that, that doesn't allow BIA to receive public safety and justice funding in states like Alaska that are PL280? I'm trying to to figure out this, this funding piece of it, because in addition to serving on the authorizing, I'm also on the appropriating side of this. So help me out. Absolutely, and, and, and thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, for, and as, as somebody who's been to Alaska several times, uh, I, I understand a, a lot of the unique challenges, and uh, it's good to see my, my, my home state senator. Uh, I, I thought I knew rural uh, coming from South Dakota, but, but it's, it's a different ballgame up in Alaska. And as you noted, uh, resources are, are a challenge. Uh, one thing that I would point to uh, is that there is a, a line item uh, within our budget that is specifically reserved for funding uh, public law 280 uh, court systems uh, in uh, 2019, uh, that was funded at uh, 13 million, and in uh, 21, it was funded at 15 million. Um, in addition to that, uh, we continue uh, to provide uh, training and technical assistance to assist uh, Native villages in standing up uh, their own court systems. Um, Right now, about 130 of the 229 villages uh, have court systems, and, and we're uh, looking to uh, continue our work to help those villages stand up their court systems. I'll have further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I definitely want to thank you and uh, Senator Murkowski both for holding this important hearing. Washington State has one of the highest numbers of murdered and missing indigenous women and uh, definitely always applaud the Seattle Indian Health Board for their work on this and my colleagues who are here today who have fought so hard on this getting legislation implemented. I think we're here because we still see the crisis and we still see that we are, I think, the issue is short of resources. I think that what we're saying is we've identified this problem. We want to do something about it. We've put some resources on the table, but I think we're now finding that the resources are not enough. So I would like to hear from Ms. Randall. Definitely want you to come to Washington State, if you will, and meet with our various law enforcement communities. Um, but I would like to hear from you and um, NCAI Chair President Von Sharp about what, what is the real crisis at hand? Is it resources? Is it the tribal court system? What is it that we need at this moment to further accelerate uh, helping to protect uh, women in Indian country. Thank you, Senator, and I would be honored to visit and, and sit, with, uh, sit with folks. The Department of Justice sees the need for really broad response to MMIP, and in the, after the Tribal Nation Summit, our Deputy Attorney General 
set up a steering committee across DOJ that will include both grant making and prosecution because we need that holistic response. It's also important that when we're talking about tribal problems that we are meeting them with tribal solutions. And so consulting with the tribes has got to be a really key part of making important and strategic decisions going forward. We are coordinating, of course, with the Not Invisible Commission and bringing, I think, significant resources to bear. The department has requested additional funding in the president's budget, and we look forward to our, our work together to identify strategic specific resources. So, President Sharp. Yes, good to, uh, to, good to see you virtually, Senator. Thank you for the question. Um, I think you raised an important uh, connection. When, when you consider missing and murdered indigenous women and the, the boarding school crisis that we're seeing, as, as well as these um, issues of violence against our women and, and girls, it, it's all related. It's generation after generation of tribal nations, not only not securing the resources that the United States should uphold pursuant to treaties and its trust responsibility, but our own inability to raise revenues through systems of taxation. And as we are entering a sort of a post-COVID time of redefining our economies and trying to re restore our economies, it's critically important that Congress consider not only supporting and honoring our treaty and trust responsibility, but the economic agenda that tribal nations see for providing the resources that we should be doing as an attribute of our inherent sovereignty. And we have all kinds of recommendations related to tax policy, economic policy, international trade related to green and renewable energy. Indian country is a target rich environment to unlock an economy, but we just need the support of Congress. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, and I'm assuming you're referring to the issues of, you know, prosecution on uh, tribal reservations, but there's nothing that's holding us back from larger prosecutions of these crimes involving that aren't actually occurring on the reservation land. Is that correct? That's Ms. absolutely correct. Yes. Ms. Randall, do you have a comment about that? Well, I can't comment on any ongoing prosecutions. I know that my um, colleagues at the Executive Office of the U.S. Attorneys um, have been investing significant resources into these cases. Well, I, I think the reason, I'm just, I haven't drilled down on every detail, but I'm pretty sure the reason why the Seattle Indian Health Board did this study and analysis is because, and we have one of the highest uh, rates of missing and indigenous uh, women, is because it's right there in Puget Sound. And they just happen to be very large percentage of them Alaska natives. So this is uh, a population that doesn't live on tribal land, and yet they have become victims of these horrific crimes. And so I would love you to come to Seattle. Maybe Senator Murkowski and I will join you and we'll uh, do something to, to bring focus to this. But separate, we, we definitely get the separate issue because we've all been involved with VAWA and uh, the more empowering of DOJ working with Indian country on uh, on tribal courts and that process to make sure that federal law is enforced on uh, Indian country land. We get that, but but for us, this is you know is a multi-pronged uh, issue at, in again uh, obviously impacting non-Native uh, American women as well. And being on a corridor like I-5 uh, helps accelerate some of these problems. So we would love to figure out ways to go take the next step here and get the enforcement of this law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Deputy Director Randall, um, in your experience, how have the provisions included in the 2013 reauthorization of VAWA been beneficial for tribes? Yes, Senator. They have been beneficial by allowing tribes to, you know, often hold repeat offenders accountable. Um, you know, Tulalip has an example where the perpetrator had, had 19 prior contacts with tribal police before SDVCJ is passed. So this helps hold the, this helps keep the whole community safe in addition to finding justice for those survivors. Under uh the 2013, 2013 VAWA, what's covered under the uh, SDVCJ? Uh, what, what, what does that include? Domestic violence, dating violence, and uh, certain protection orders. And are there uh, areas of criminal jurisdiction that you believe should be expanded for tribes, uh, uh, and if so, why? 
Yes, Senator. As we have heard so compellingly today, you know, crimes that occur um, often in conjunction with domestic violence, such as crimes against children, are crucial to be able to prosecute. Also, sexual assault, sex trafficking, uh, you know, assault of law enforcement. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Secretary Little Elk Garriott, um, I understand that there are currently 28 tribes that have implemented VAWA Special Domestic Violence Criminal Jurisdiction, SDVCJ. In your experience, what considerations does a tribe undertake when determining whether to uh, elect this jurisdiction? Thank, thank you. When a tribe decides to assert this jurisdiction, uh, there are a number of uh, provisions and actions that it has to take from its standpoint, uh, including uh, making sure that its uh, law and order code uh, is uh, in place and that it meets those requirements, uh, and that also it has uh, access to the resources that it needs. And our part uh, at Indian Affairs really focuses around uh, technical assistance uh, in training to assist those tribes in standing up their court system so that they can implement those provisions. <coughs> Why aren't there more tribes that have adopted this jurisdiction? Anecdotally, uh, we can say that uh, it, it's, a, it's a large undertaking and that, uh, again, you know, make, ensuring that a, a, when a tribe makes this decision that they have the resources, um, also the political will, and ensure, again, assuring that, that they're uh, feeling comfortable from a tribal government perspective to uh, stand, stand this up, that their court is, is fully staffed and has the adequate resources that it needs. So is it primarily resources? And do you expect more tribes to do it? Resources is, is definitely a challenge. Uh, we uh, are, have continued to provide training, and, and there's been a tremendous response. Uh, we've provided training to over uh, 3,300 3, participants, um, and that there are a number of tribes that are contemplating this. I don't have the exact number, uh, but you know, I think as, as we've heard some of the other uh, witnesses eloquently uh, discuss, uh, there is a definite and strong desire uh, for tribes to begin going down this road and, and asserting their inherent jurisdiction. Uh, for Governor Chaveria, um, as a, a tribe that's implemented special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction, um, could you talk about your tribe's experiences with the implementation? Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, so for Santa Clara Pueblo, we opted in because for generations we recognize the damage done by domestic violence. And what's very critical to understand, uh, Chairman, uh, Senator, is that it makes our tribal court into a federal court system. So because of those reasons, it took Santa Clara a number of years to implement uh, VAWA because we had to adopt certain measures to take concrete actions to meet the federal standards for implementation of VAWA, these were administrative burdensome and, and costly to undertake. And so one example is that we had to implement standards for updating our facilities. But unfortunately, Senator, we had a mobile home and it was mice infested. So we had to reach out to uh, the Department of Justice, Office of Tribal Justice and Bureau of Justice Administration for some funds to renovate and expand uh, our courthouse. So the facility standard that we had to meet in order to implement VAWA was we had to have a secure, healthy facility with closed files, a detention room for alleged offenders, expand our public seating, a community education room, a jury box, a jury deliberation room, modern recording devices, fire and safety upgrades, and disability accessibility and so those are the reasons why it does take time and challenging for tribes to implement this because of the issue to include federal funding. Without federal funding, it's very important because we had to use funding to hire legally trained prosecutors, defense attorneys, again, build these facilities so that we are meeting that federal requirement of turning our tribal courthouse into a federal courthouse to implement this very important initiative uh, to protect the life, safety, and welfare of our entire community, uh, Senator. Uh, thank you, Governor. And that's a very striking background you have there. I just wanted to uh, compliment you on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lujan. 
And uh, Mr. Hoven, we'll invite you to New Mexico, sir, and we'll take you there personally. So with your, with your permission, Governor, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. I, I look forward to getting you out to New Mexico, sir. Um, <laughs> appreciate that, Senator. I was proud to introduce the Native Youth and Tribal Officer Protection Act to provide more support and authority under special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians in domestic violence situations involving children and tribal law enforcement. The bill will help Pueblos and tribes like Santa Clara make their community safer and reduce violence against their most vulnerable members. Governor Chavaria, yes or no, is it true that the Pueblo still cannot prosecute crimes against children and tribal law enforcement officers when non-Indians commit domestic violence? Yes, Chairman, member of the committee. And Governor Chavaria, yes or no, is it true that neither the state nor federal law enforcement authorities prosecuted a domestic violence case on the Pueblo when a non-Indian assaulted a responding tribal officer? Yes, Chairman, members of the committee. And Chief Judge Forstar, yes or no, does the Fort Peck, Usan Boyne, and the Sioux tribe had domestic violence cases come before tribal courts that they could not prosecute because of limited VAWA jurisdiction over children and tribal officers? Yes, that is true. And Governor Chavaria, yes or no, would you agree that legislation is needed to expand special criminal jurisdictions for tribal courts to be able to prosecute non-Indians that commit domestic violence crimes on tribal lands against children and tribal law enforcement? Yes, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Governor Chavaria, uh, yes or no, did your Pueblo need to seek additional federal funding outside the VAWA grant program to meet federal standards to implement special criminal jurisdiction? Yes, Chairman, members of the committee. And Professor Reese, would you agree that additional federal funding is critical for tribal public safety generally, and particularly for tribes that opt to exercise VAWA special criminal jurisdiction? Absolutely. And Ms. Randall, um, yes or no, in tribal consultation, have tribes cited the need to amend VAWA to increase funding to exercise special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction and help more tribes participate in the program. Yes, they have, Senator. And President Sharp, um, the 2018 NCAI report on five years of special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction notes that implementation of the law revealed serious limitations in the law. Uh, President Sharp, yes or no, does the report note that current statute prevents tribes from prosecuting crimes against children and law enforcement? Yes. And President Sharp, yes or no, do you believe expanding tribes' ability to prosecute crimes against children and tribal law enforcement is a needed expansion of the 2013 VAWA law? Yes. And Governor Chavaria, um, I wanted to give you a minute or so just to explain some of the additional challenges that you have faced that you hope that additional VAWA legislation or reauthorization should be able to cover? Uh, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, yes, and for a long time, uh, Senator, we recognize that the damage of domestic violence. And so without the federal aid and protection from funding to build up our internal capacity to protect our law enforcement officers, grandma, grandpa, the entire households, include myself. As a tribal governor, I also respond to these calls because it, it impacts our entire community. And so it's very critical, uh, Chairman, members of the committee, that we expand the current VAWA to include all the officers, tribal officials, our children, grandpa and grandma, to include our, our tribal court system, to having that uh, jurisdiction to prosecute these non-native offenders within our tribal court system. We cannot, have, we cannot have a lawless community because it hurts all of us. And so this is very critical, uh, Senator, that we continue to help you look at 
to include the Indian Civil Rights Act, the domestic violence section, again, mandates requirements that are costly. With the support of federal funding, Santa Clara Pueblo is undertaking the training of the victim advocates, law enforcement, prosecutors, and public defenders. So with that said, Senator, members of the committee, additional federal funding is critical so that we can meet these challenges to implement this uh, to the full standard, uh, Senator. Thank you, Governor Chavarria. Thank you, Chair. I, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Daines. Chairman Chats, thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski, for holding this very important hearing on the Violence Against Women Act as it relates to the tribal provisions. It's a topic of a great importance for so many Montanans, including myself. Uh, thank you, Chief Judge Forstar, Fort Peck, for joining us from Poplar, Montana. We have a couple other great Montanans here today from uh, Fort Belknap. I see Terry Brocky back there, and uh, I think it's Tuffy Helgelson back there, if I can see him behind his cowboy hat. But uh, welcome. Good to have you here. Uh, I will tell you, first, before I make the rest of my comments and ask my question, uh, I am proud to sit here as a supporter of the VAWA reauthorization of 2013. I remember having uh, women from Indian country coming into my office and sitting down and telling me their story that was very persuasive and helpful in coming to my own decision to vote in favor of the VAWA reauthorization of 2013. I think VAWA has been a critical piece of legislation in combating missing and murdered indigenous women crisis. In fact, I'm encouraged by the, the bipartisan work that's being done in the committee in the current direction of the negotiations. It's been hung up a few times, uh, and I think we've got to get these tribal provisions right, and I think we're headed in the right direction. But that said, I will tell you it's disheartening to see some partisan politics going on with the underlying bill and a, to push an unconstitutional version that was passed by the House. Democrats, by extension, are holding up any hope at a bipartisan deal with the underlying bill by pushing it and pushing an unconstitutional version that was passed by the House. The reason is because there are provisions here that will attempt to strip Montanans of their Second Amendment rights. The larger package that passed the U.S. House in March contains language that would stifle Montanans' right to keep and bear arms. The current conversation circulating around VAWA uh, includes President Biden's unconstitutional gun control agenda surrounding the so-called boyfriend loophole. As H.R. 1620 shows, the apparent cost of closing this new loophole is to, number one, enact retroactive lifetime gun bans for misdemeanor offenses, two, create federal ex parte gun bans, and three, fund and train police agencies to seize guns from these new retroactively prohibited gun owners. Should a misdemeanor stand as the line crossed for an individual to lose a constitutional right? That's an important question. Should Americans be deprived of a constitutional right without first facing their accuser in a court of law? This current language would essentially create red flag gun confiscation orders in states that have never passed one. By adding an ex parte gun ban to restraining order laws, meaning an individual could lose their right to bear arms without even knowing it. On top of that, this bill subsidizes the prosecution of misdemeanor gun bans, misdemeanor gun bans, and the enforcement of these newly co-opted gun confiscation laws. We don't need more infringements on the right to keep and bear arms. We need to restore it. There was a recent Wall Street Journal article just from September. About 50% of new gun buyers are women. Historically, it's been about 10 to 20% for decades. Until the last two years, 50% approximately of all new U.S. gun buyers are women. There's a reason for that. They want to be able to protect themselves. Women do not need more gun control. Gun rights are women's rights. Yet my colleagues are using an important piece of legislation I believe is a Trojan horse for gun control legislation that otherwise would never, ever be passed. It's imperative that we as a legislative body Put some of these pet projects aside. Let's remove this language from VAWA and get back to the bipartisan nature of the conversation and negotiations, and let's get VAWA reauthorized again. Chief Judge Forstar, what are some of the biggest challenges combating violence against women in Indian country? The challenges that we've experienced at Fort Peck is
Chief, I think we, Judge, we've lost your uh, sound. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Some of the challenges that we've experienced at Fort Peck is incarceration. Uh, incarceration, that may be justice to some, but not to all. So Fort Peck has looked at other alternatives. Uh, we do have our own jail. It is a 638 program. It is a tribal jail, but it is facilitated for long-term incarceration. But with VAWA, it isn't so much incarceration that seems to be the forefront of what our victims are telling us as they're coming in. It's restorative justice, it's rehabilitation because they all remain members of the community and they have families and they want the family unit to remain together. So that's why we have focused on more of the alternatives to sentencing. But the challenge that we did have at the very beginning was medical costs for those that were incarcerated. It wasn't the issue of incarcerating or providing for them. It was just the medical costs that came with pre-existing pre health conditions prior to them being in our custody. But as some of the other uh, members have mentioned, funding is always an issue. But I have to say at Fort Peck, Funding wasn't the issue for us because we had already started with the Tribal Law and Order Act and becoming com compliant with that. So we already had a lot of those um, effective assistance of counsel, attorney prosecutor, we, we had a lot of those in place. So it was just a matter of how fast we can move with it. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, Chief Judge Forstar, thank you. Um, thank you for your service there in uh, Poplar. And, uh, and also for your continued progress in, in, in the, the 638 transition. Chairman Chatz. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I wanna thank all of you for being with us here today. And I'd like to especially thank our distinguished witness from the great state of South Dakota, um, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Little Elk. Um, it's good to see you and, it's, and I'm very pleased to see you here with us today. I look forward to hearing about your experiences and your insight into how VAWA has impacted our tribes and native communities in South Dakota and, and elsewhere as well as you've been here and learned. My first question though is for Chief Judge uh, Forstar. Uh, I understand some reauthorization efforts for the Violence Against Women Act have discussed the value of expanding tribal jurisdiction over non-members for additional crimes. In your experience presiding over cases in your tribal court system, would expanded jurisdiction help or hinder your tribe's capacity to handle an increased caseload? Definitely help. The, to expand it to include children, law enforcement, we've even talked about drugs and alcohol, and it's to be able to provide the services that are needed for the offenders, the victims, and all of those that are affected by the crimes. With the expansion, it wouldn't put any undue uh, hardships on the Fort Peck tribes. It is just going to elevate what we can do for our communities. Because at the present time, although we can provide services, we can't necessarily provide the defendant with the offender accountability that they may need in regards to what has been occurring with the children. And with the law enforcement, um, I just wanna say real quick that with our cross deputization agreement, it, had, it has been successful. It's been in effect since 1999. Uh, we have offered you know, the SLEC, the Special Law Enforcement Commission, um, the criminal justice um, force, so that those that are cross deputized to enforce tribal law with this commission, they are able to fall under the umbrella of a federal prosecution if needed, if they are to be assaulted. That's one of the gap fillers that we've attempted to use at Fort Peck because we cannot prosecute those crimes when law enforcement is involved with a non-Indian offender. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um Assistant Secretary Little Elk, um, you've been in this new role now for a few months, and I'd like to get your perspective on common barriers the department sees with regard to the tribe's ability to implement 
special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction. As I understand it, in, in South Dakota, only the Sisseton and Wapen and Oyate and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe have taken the steps to implement this special jurisdiction. I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I'm just curious with regard to our local tribes. Why haven't other tribes in our home state implemented this expanded jurisdiction? What do you see as options that might be make it more or, or more available to them? Uh, with, uh, without taking the, the risk of uh, speaking on behalf of our, our tribes in South Dakota, uh, I can only speak from lived experience. But overall, uh, you know, from a national perspective, I, I think that uh, one of the, the things that we consistently hear from tribes uh, through various uh, tribal consultations, uh, including the Tribal Budget Advisory Committee and other forums in which we get to engage and, and hear directly from tribal leaders uh, is the uh, resource challenges. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, in our FY22 uh, budget request, uh, we've asked for an additional uh, 58 million for law and for, uh, for justice services to make for a total of 507 million uh, overall. Um, the bulk of that, uh, those resources uh, of that request uh, really goes towards uh, increased staffing um, and, and for law enforcement services on the ground uh, with an additional uh, 5 million for uh, tribal courts and tribal court uh, uh, O&M um, areas. And, you know, again, a an uh, anecdotally, I think that, that many tribes are, are, you know, looking to make sure that their law enforcement services, that their detention centers, uh, and that their court systems are uh, adequately staffed and fully functional before taking on, uh, you know, kind of the a new uh, additional, uh, and, and before asserting additional sovereignty and jurisdiction to take on uh, the provisions as uh, in, in VAWA. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Moran. Chairman Schatz, thank you. Uh, thank you and Ranking Member Murkowski for holding this oversight hearing. I, I supported VAWA in 2013, and I look forward to uh, building on the tribal provisions that were contained in it. And I thank our witnesses for being here today. Um, but... Uh, I, I'm the ranking member of the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, the importance in this uh, arena is the, the Department of Justice. And I, I'd like to direct my uh, questions in regard to some of the appropriation issues. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto asked one of the issues I was uh, interested in. Uh, the nearest FBI field office to a tribe in Kansas is not quite 90 minutes away. And uh, I appreciate your question, and I appreciate what uh, information we receive from the answers. But distance is always a problem for us in Kansas, and our tribes are not located, uh, tribal lands are not located close to any cities. And so it, it, it is a significant challenge. Um, this, is, this is a question I direct to any and all. Um, let me, let me start with Ms. Randall. I'll, I'll ask you this question first. You mentioned the president's request for increasing funding at the Office of Violence Against Women's tribal-specific grant programs by $46 million. What gaps are, have you identified that that additional funding would fill? Thank you, Senator. Um, one really targeted piece of funding would be for tribal special U.S. attorneys. That prosecutorial role um, is a gap that we would like to fill. Um, we would provide more funding for tribal governments overall, and that's to implement everything from victim services to supporting tribal law enforcement. I think also very important is uh, tribal jurisdiction, and we do have a specific program to help tribes implement, right? Tribes who haven't started yet to implement that jurisdiction to do so. Uh, Ms. Randall, you mentioned also in your written testimony that the FY22 CJS bill includes new funding for tribal special assistant U.S. attorneys. Um, you mentioned that's something still uh, on the want list, uh, but perhaps you can discuss with me a little more about the importance of this program. Absolutely. Well, tribal special U.S. attorneys are um, cross-designated to be able to bring cases um, with a tribal expertise 
in the federal court, working you know, incredibly closely as, uh, as members of the U.S. attorney team. And we've seen in many states that this allows uh, the federal government through this program to bring significantly more prosecutions than we might be able to otherwise and have the expertise of the tribal prosecutor who has been cross-designated. And are those, I mean, I assume that tribal law and federal law and state law and regarding tribes is a, is a significant specialty, not that every attorney would know. And I certainly would know that those who have experience either as tribal members or strong association with tribes would have a better understanding of cultural and other issues that would be uh, of significant importance. Um, does, the, does a U.S. attorney in this circumstance, does the U.S. attorney select those individuals? They work for the U.S. attorney? Well, you are exceeding my specialized area of expertise, Senator, so I would love to take that back and make sure that we have all of the right details for you. Okay, I'd be glad to hear more. I, I would point out that uh, Senator Schatz and Senator Murkowski are members, as you would know, of the subcommittee that appropriates that we're talking about, and I look forward to working with them uh, as we continue our efforts first to get uh, this fiscal year uh, completed and as we will look forward to next year. Uh, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Senator Moran, uh, full disclosure, uh, the vice chair and I were just praising you behind your back. Surprised at your willingness to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, uh, to our, our colleague who is so adeptly spearheading CJS, thank you, and we, we will work on these initiatives. I wanted to ask just um, a couple final, well, one final uh, question uh, to Professor Reese, but first, uh, Ms. Randall, I want to acknowledge the announcement that you've made saying that we're going to have this consultation in uh, the annual consultation in Alaska. We'll look forward to, um, to welcoming you and, and being part of those. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Randall, we have, we've all cited your report. Thank you um, for, for dealing with some of the concerns that home, so many had expressed following uh, VAWA 2013. Um, despite the statistics, despite um, uh, the report, there is still that doubt. Uh, you use the word distrust. I think there is still some concern. I certainly hear it in Alaska when we talk about the prospects for, for the pilot um, that we have outlined in, in our draft legislation. And I, I really appreciate that you, you've succinctly stated that, look, first what we have to do is clarify the law because concerns are rooted in, you say, several fundamental misunderstandings of that law. I think that that is correct. And the second is a simple reminder that tribal governments are American governments, too, worthy of our trust and dignity. And your final statement is worth repeating. Um, for those who would suggest that we shouldn't be moving forward with this special jurisdiction, um, Professor Reese states, our reasons for keeping them out of it are rooted in fear, distrust, and assumptions about their capacity to soundly administer the law that all ought to be long since in our past. I certainly agree with them, um, but I, I know we're still dealing with some of these ghosts of the past, and so I would ask, and it's directed to you, Professor Reese, but, but I'd also be willing to hear from our administration witnesses as well, as to... What, what else is it that we have to do to, to gain the trust, to, to, to assure that there is a level of capacity that can be met? Certainly with our, with our uh, proposal in the Alaska project, um, there is, a, there's a, there is a, a, an effort um, where the attorney general uh, works with the, uh, uh, works with the tribes to determine those that uh, will be able to provide systems that fully protect defendants' rights under federal law. Um, there, is, there are protections that we feel that we have incorporated, but still we meet this, this resistance. Is it just fear of the unknown, even though these, these have been in place for eight years? What more do we need to do? Because I've got some convincing with some colleagues who are not sure that this is going to be too experimental 
that this justice will be too experimental. My response right now is, in many cases, there is no justice. That, that is the experiment that is happening, is no justice. And so I am willing to, to engage in, in some pilot projects that maybe push things out a little bit more beyond people's comfort zone. Because right now, right now, people, women, are vulnerable. They're being destroyed because we don't have these protections. So we've got to do something different. But help me out with how we get beyond the distrust of this. And I'll, I'll turn to you, Professor, first. Oh, ab absolutely. Thank you for the, for the question and, and for the, the kind remarks about, about my testimony. Um, so I, I would say that um, you could do several things, one of which is to take them to Indian country. You know, take them to Judge Stacy's courtroom and, and show off the amazing work that she is doing to provide justice for the people of her community. Um, because I think really seeing um, Indian country in action and justice in action, um, you know, does so much more uh, to generate that kind of trust than, you know, all of the possible rights protections and laws that we could we could write up um, when really if, if what we're talking about is is just a skepticism um, that's that's more deeply rooted as 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 you've said um, so so I, I would I would suggest suggest that um, if possible but I'd I'd also you know like like you also said you know right now there is there is no justice so of course certainly you know, trying something is, is necessary, but also to remind folks, you know, not to hold tribal governments to a unfair and unrealistically high standard of perfection before we let them um, try out uh, justice over fellow American citizens. I think if we expect them to be um, something that is in effect like perfect, you know, infallible, always, you know, delivering perfect rights, you know, that's, that's not, that's not fair. That's not the way court systems in the United States works. What happens in state courts as well is that, um, you know, there are laws on the books that ensure that citizens are protected when they mess up. That's how laws and protections work, um, is to make sure that citizens are protected because courts aren't perfect. Um, and so I think the same thing is in place in Indian country. We have these laws to protect and recognize that courts won't be perfect all the time. Um, they're run by people, uh, but they're necessary for justice. And we have, in fact, in place the federal protections that, uh, that are already afforded in law. It's not as if there is no due process that it is, is at play here. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for this hearing and, and for all of the witnesses that, to your, to your point, um, I think it has been extraordinary testimony that the committee has received, and I look forward to working with all of my colleagues as we work to advance uh, this, this restoration of justice through VAWA. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. I want to thank the staff. Uh, I want to thank the advocates. I want to thank the leaders in Indian country, uh, our testifiers, the administration, everybody who's uh, moving forward with this legislation. We are on our way. If there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>